Welcome to Damn Good Movie Memories with your host, Ryan Davis. This podcast is the cure for your long commute and super boring work day. Hey there, it's Brian Davis, and for this week's episode, we're going to cover the movie People Will Talk from 1951. The studio was 20th Century Fox, release date was August 29th, 1951. The running time, 110 minutes, and it was in black and white. Leonard Maltin from his classic movie guy gives it 3.5 out of 4 stars. He writes, Genuinely offbeat, absorbing comedy drama of a philosophical man, Cary Grant, who insists on treating his patients as human beings. A small-minded colleague, played by Hume Cronin, is intimidated by his radical approach to doctoring and sets out to defame him. A fine cast and a talky but most worthwhile film, which obviously parallels to the then-current HUAC investigation and the McCarthy witch hunt. Usually I first remember seeing many of the films in my collection, but this one I can't quite pin down. It was either at the Stanford Theater or on Turner Classic Movies. In any case, I likely saw it while trying to watch every single Cary Grant film available, and this immediately became another favorite film that he starred in for me. Okay, let's get into the main cast. Of course, you have Cary Grant, who plays Dr. Noah Pretorius. Now, I've already covered Grant's career in the episodes for Monkey Business. That was with Ginger Rogers in 1952 and The Philadelphia Story with James Stewart and Katherine Hepburn in 1940. And frankly, I could dedicate an entire podcast, not just one episode, on Cary Grant's career. And he just might be my favorite actor of all time. In any case, be ready for many more Cary Grant films for the duration of Damn Good Movie Memories. Gene Crane plays Deborah Higgins. Now, this is the first film I've covered for the very beautiful Crane, whose career began in the early 1940s. Her best-known films prior to People Will Talk were the musical State Fair with Dana Andrews, Leave Her to Heaven with Gene Tierney, Margie, An Apartment for Peggy with William Holden, A Letter to Three Wives, and Pinky, which earned her an Oscar nomination for Best Actress. The director and screenwriter was Joseph Mankiewicz. Now, Mankiewicz began as a screenwriter before becoming a director and had a long and successful career in Hollywood. His best-known directed films prior to People Will Talk were Dragonwick, The Late George Apley, The Ghost of Mrs. Muir, A Letter to Three Wives, House of Strangers, No Way Out, and arguably his best-known film of all, All About Eve. Okay, let's get into the movie. So it opens with the following text. This will be part of the story of Noah Pretorius, M.D. That is not his real name, of course. There may be some who will claim to have identified Dr. Pretorius at once. There may be some who will reject the possibility that such a doctor lives, or could have lived. And there may be some who will hope that, if hasn't or doesn't, he most certainly should. Our story is also, always with high regard, about medicine and the medical profession. Respectfully, therefore, with humble gratitude, this film is dedicated to one who has inspired man's unending battle against death, and without whom the battle is never won, the patient. Next, we cut to the main antagonist of the film, Dr. Rodney Elwell, played by Hume Cronin. Elwell is a professor at a medical school and is investigating a popular doctor and fellow professor named Noah Pretorius. That's Cary Grant. Elwell dislikes Noah's methods and is trying to get him discredited and fired from the college and and basically ruin his practice. He starts by interviewing a woman who knew Noah years earlier in his hometown. The woman is played by the great Margaret Hamilton. Of course, she was the Wicked Witch in the original Wizard of Oz. And she steals the show in her brief scene here. Elwell? I am Rodney Elwell. Do you wish to see me? Pickett. I beg your pardon? Sarah Pickett. Quite so, your name. In any case, I'm late for They said for me to come right away. Who said? The agency. The agency? What agency? Well, of course, the detective agency, Sergeant Coonan. Yes, come in, come in. If I come in, does the door get closed? Naturally. Then I don't come in. Why not? You know why not. You're grown up. My dear Mrs. Pickett. Miss Pickett, and don't butter me up. I have conducted my affairs behind closed doors for 20 years. Not with me. You overestimate both of us. Have it your way. Yes, here we are. You are Rebecca Pickett, is that correct? Sarah Pickett. Quite so. Sarah. Rebecca Pickett is my grandma. 
was your grandma. She still is. She's 103. Interesting. She's a liar. Possibly. 108 if she's a day. Probably. Miss Sarah Pickett, you were engaged some 15 years ago by one Noah Pretorius. As his housekeeper? That's right. Where? Goose Creek, where I come from. Goose Creek. Goose Creek is a little village way down state, is it not? Way back in the hills. And at that time, what was the profession of this Pretorius? He was a doc. A doc? He healed people. How? If I knew how, I'd be a doc myself. I mean, what were his methods of treatment? Well, some healers use one thing and some use another. But Doc Pretorius used them all. Once he'd give a powder. Sometimes syrup. Sometimes pills. Sometimes a jab with a needle. And sometimes just talk. Just sit there and talk about a body's misery and talk a body into being well. Like working a miracle. Uh, a miracle worker, too, eh? Well, if my grandma isn't a miracle, what is? Your grandma? Four times she lay down to die, and four times he talked her off on her feet. Told her she was going to live forever. Looks like he was right. Doc, healer, miracle worker, possible hypnotist. Check on narcotics administered. Now, Miss Pickett, are you completely certain that this man's name was Noah Pretorius? Would I make up a name like that? And is this Doc Pretorius by whom you were employed the same man as the famous Dr. Pretorius of this university and this city? Doc Pretorius was already as famous as you can get back in Goose Creek. He had people coming from miles around. But is he now the famous Dr. Pretorius? When you say doctor, do you mean school doctor out of books? That is precisely what I mean. Can't say. For my part, I wouldn't get caught dead in a room with one of them. Miss Pickett, I am a school doctor out of books. That's one reason why the door is open. This man. Is he the healer? The miracle worker? Is this Doc Pretorius? That's him. Only he looked younger 15 years ago. We all did. Not me. We come now, Miss Pickett, to the most important subject of all. What can you tell me about a man named Shunderson? Who did you say? Shunderson. Hello? It's, uh, it's Hoskins, Professor Elwell. Well, in case, perhaps, Professor Elwell, you'd forgotten, uh, the class is still waiting. Oh, yes, Professor, of course. No, 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 not at all. It's, it's just that, well, uh, Dr. Pretorius is also waiting to see you. Dr. Pretorius? To see me? Well, well, he'll have to wait, too. But not for long, eh, Miss Pickett? What's the matter with you? What's in this for me, Professor Elwell? I thought that Sergeant Coonan had made it quite clear. He said you wanted some information from me but also that you were going to give me a job. That's right. What kind of a job? In the dissecting rooms, as sort of a housekeeper. What I want to know is, will the job be worth it? Will the job be worth what, Miss Pickett? Shunderson. Tell me about him. I didn't know very much. Nobody did. Tell me everything you knew or heard. Every detail. You're a professor, and it's hard to make you understand anything that ain't in a book. Well, most of what goes on in the world ain't in a book. Spare me your philosophy. What about Shunderson? To begin with, we used to call him the Bat. Hamilton is so great in that last scene, and her facial expressions are terrific. We then cut to Noah and his colleague and confidant, Shunderson, played by Finlay Curry. Noah is about to start lecturing his class and is perturbed by Elwell ignoring their meeting. Noah goes on with his lecture as a young woman who is deceased lays as a cadaver on the table. Did it ever occur to you, Shunderson, that skeletons always laugh? No, oh, why? Why should a man die and then laugh for the rest of eternity?
What news, Uriah? Oh, I've just spoken with Professor Elwell, Doctor. He regrets exceedingly that he is unavoidably detained. A meaningless phrase, which could signify anything from oversleeping to being arrested for malpractice. I've never known the professor to be late before. Mm, he'd be the last to tolerate it than anyone else. Ah, it saddens me, Uriah. An unmistakable symptom of human weakness. Professor Elwell, of all men. Have you your notebooks ready? I would be quite unable to give the lecture you came to hear, and I'm not sure you should hear the lecture I'd like to give. Well, we want to hear anything you've got to say, Dr. Pretorius. That's very flattering. Thank you. We thank you. The cadaver and I. A cadaver in a classroom. As students of medicine, it's important at the outset that you realize that a cadaver in a classroom is not a dead human being. I don't understand that, Doctor. Anatomy is more or less the study of the human body. The human body is not necessarily the human being. Here lies a cadaver, the fact that she was not long ago, a living, warm, lovely young girl. There's of little consequence in this classroom. You will not be required to dissect and examine the love that was in her, or the hate, or the hope, despair, memories, and desires that motivated every moment of her existence. They ceased to exist when she ceased to exist. Instead, for weeks and months to come, you would dissect, examine, and identify her organs, bones, muscles, tissues, and so on, one by one. And these you will faithfully record in your notebooks. And when the notebooks are filled, you will know all about this cadaver that the medical profession requires you to know. Oh! Oh! Get back! Get back! Get back! You don't, don't touch her! Quiet her. down! Quiet down! A triple cup scotch would know better than the crowd like this. Back up. Have you any idea why you fainted? Have you ever fainted before? How do you feel? Silly. I think you better tell a doctor about this. There may be a reason. Can you get up now? Good. Perhaps you better go somewhere and relax. You go with her. And you know, if you insist upon studying anatomy, I suggest you do not sit on the aisle. Have a candy. Thank you. You're not leaving, Doctor. Yes, you are. And please give my thanks to Professor Elwell for the use of the hall. It's been fun. Oh, I can't understand his not being here. It's most unusual. It's an unusual world, Uriah. I understand I've kept you waiting. Please forgive me. It was most urgent business. My business, on the other hand, was the idlest of curiosity. You were going to let me know about a tumor you'd found. Ah, yes. A malignant dysgerminoma. Professor Elwell, you are the only man I know who can say malignant the way other people say bingo. A malignant dysgerminoma. Good day, Professor Elwell. Good day. The woman who fainted after seeing the cadaver is named Deborah Higgins. That's Jean Crane. Unlike Elwell, Noah has a terrific bedside manner and a natural warmth to people, at least to those that deserve that warmth. Elwell never earns that kindness. By the way, Shunderson is often silent, but there's more to that you will find later. Noah and Shunderson then drive to the clinic that Noah has founded and operates. Doctor, unless all of the patients are served breakfast at the same time, I cannot operate the kitchen with our present personnel. Then hire more people to work in the kitchen. But it is common practice in hospitals. There's still more in my clinic. No patient shall be wakened from a health-giving sleep and forced to eat breakfast at a time which pleases a culinary union. But in the interest of good economy... Bad therapy is never good economy. If you must economize, do it in the doctor's dining room. And I will not have all the patients bathed at the stroke of a gong for the convenience of the nurses. One of the reasons for my founding this clinic is a firm conviction that patients are sick people, not inmates. Of course, Dr. Pretorius. Mm. 
I'll bet I know what you're thinking. Here comes Dr. Happiness, a good humor man. If he tries to cheer me up, so help me, I'll hit him with an ice bag, right? Wrong. Not that I blame him. One of the few pleasures of being sick is the right to feel good and miserable, and don't let any doctor tell you differently. I was thinking it's not much fun when you get to be old. Oh, it's even less fun if you don't get to be old. I want to die. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Just lie around in the coffin all day with nothing to do. How was last night? Just fine, Doctor. Well, if we have another good night tonight, maybe tomorrow morning we'll go back into surgery and take another look. Doctor, does it hurt when you die? Not a bit. Where'd you get that idea? They tell me there's so much pain. Oh. Did anyone who actually died ever tell you that? <laughs> of course not. Well, there you see. All this silly gossip about dying. You know, I nearly died once. When I was a kid. The doctors gave me up for lost. The nerve of some doctors giving people up for lost as though they found them in the first place. Anyway, I was dying. And I was in a coma. You know how it felt? No, how? Oh, it was winter at the time. And I felt as if I was flying very slowly in a sled high up in the sky. And the world below was covered in snow and ice and bitter cold. But I was warm and cozy in the back of the sled, wrapped in an ermine blanket. And then I came out of the coma. I came back to life. How'd you feel? Awful. I had a splitting headache and I vomited for three days. I've never felt as good being alive as I did when I was dying. <laughs> You certainly make dying a pleasure, Dr. Pretorius. Mm, well, we'll keep that our little secret, shall we? I wouldn't want that to get around. Part of the charm of Noah is that you have Cary Grant playing the character, and there's never been a more charming actor in the history of cinema. But Noah, the character, proves that being a doctor isn't solely about medical knowledge and pushing pills. It's more nuanced, as it's also psychological. And he has proved that sometimes simply speaking humanely to a patient is all they need. Noah's next patient happens to be Deborah, the woman who fainted in class. She has some tests run, and Noah passes along the findings. Pardon me for getting up. It's the only exercise I take. Sit down, won't you? Mrs. Higgins, as a doctor, it's my duty, if at all possible, to find something for you to worry about. However, I cannot repudiate a laboratory report such as I hold in my hand. Mrs. Higgins, you have nothing to worry about. You mean... Everything is all right. Perfect. Then the fainting this morning, it, it didn't mean a thing, did it? Nothing out of the ordinary. You might eat lightly, however, on the days you dissect cadavers. Oh, that? I've given that up. I wasn't really a medical student anyway, just sitting in on some courses. Well, I imagine it'll be more fun just sitting home with Mr. Higgins. Yes. Yes, it will be. I can't say how grateful I am to you, Dr. Pretorius. But just a routine examination, after all, I didn't exactly save your life. Thank you, anyway. Not at all. Now, Mrs. Higgins, don't forget to have Miss James give you another appointment in about a month. In about a month? To see you? Of course, if you can afford it, it might be preferable to have a regular obstetrician. In that case, there are several I'd be pleased to recommend. But, but didn't you say that I had nothing to worry about? That everything was all right? It couldn't be any better, Mrs. Higgins. You're pregnant. Are you sure? I mean, couldn't there be some mistake? There's always a possibility of error. However, with a result as positive as this, that possibility is remote. After all, it wasn't a very thorough test. I mean, it only took a couple of hours. I, I thought in order to be sure, you had to wait weeks. Not anymore. Nowadays, we find out about everything a lot more quickly than we used to. About life, and even about death. Now, they used to use a little pink rabbit for the pregnancy test. But now they use a frog. Not nearly as cute, but it's a lot faster. Only two hours and just as certain. The name of the frog, by the way, is Rana Pipians. Sounds like a movie star, doesn't it? You're not married. What about the baby's father? It has no father. Well, that would be the first time in the annals of biology. I have no husband. But when he knows about the baby... He'll never know. I got a telegram the other day. The other day. Seems as if he left just the other day. Seems as if we met just the other day. It's all such a crazy, mixed-up nightmare. He was in the reserve, the medical corps. 
That's why I took the courses. When he came back and we were married, I, I wanted to know something about his work. When did he leave? Six weeks ago. Or was it five? How right you are, Doctor. How quick we've become with life and death. And had you known him long? No, not even that. Not even long enough to be sure, either of us. You're not permitted enough time these days to be sure of anything. And then when he had to go, and we had to say goodbye, I was suddenly afraid. I wanted to prove to myself and to him that I wasn't afraid. Mm. The frightening things we do sometimes when we're afraid to be afraid. Sit down, why don't you? What are you afraid of now? I'm not. Then stop behaving as if fear was something to be ashamed stop of. Stop being such a pompous know it all. You don't even know what I'm crying about. Do you? Yes. Miss Higgins. I can't call you Miss Higgins. What's your first name? Deborah. Blow your nose. There's tissue in the top drawer. No, no, here. I can't speak with as much assurance as I usually do because you just called me a pompous know-it-all. I'm sorry. Don't be. I do get pompous. But I'm really not a know-it-all. As a matter of fact, right now I'm confused. By what? Well, it seems to me that if you were crying because of the father of your baby, the time for you to cry would have been when you thought you weren't pregnant. Not now that you know you are. Isn't that so? So? He isn't the reason. No, he isn't. Then were you crying because you're afraid for yourself? Afraid of what people will say? No. Are you sure? Society has a strict set of rules about that sort of thing. The bylaws of our social corporation. You violated Section A, Article 1. That can bring heavy penalties up to and including expulsion. You really think I'm a coward, don't you? Are you? No. Which brings us to the party of the third part, the baby. Are you crying because of the baby? You can't say there won't be time enough for you to love your baby. And if you're a good mother, to have it love you. It is the baby you're afraid of. In a way. Don't you want it? Of course I do, but I can't have it. I just can't have it. Why not? Why not, Deborah? You couldn't understand. I could try. Because of my father. You can never tell about fathers. They can be suddenly understanding at the most unexpected times. He's the most understanding and most gentle man in the world. Well, then... I'm all he's got. If he knew about this, it would kill him. Oh. Well, if you're all he's got, then the baby will give him just that much more. He couldn't live if he knew. Deborah, no man could be as gentle and understanding as you say and still so deeply prejudiced It's got that... nothing to do with prejudice. Then what has it to do with? Perhaps, this is only a suggestion, but perhaps if I were to tell him... No. It's possible I could put it to him in such a way No, that... please. It's very kind of you, but you mustn't even consider it. Dr. Pretorius, believe me, if you did see my father, you couldn't tell him about me. Even you wouldn't know how. And if you did, you wouldn't have the heart. Thanks, just the same. What are you going to do? I don't know. You had a pretty good idea, didn't you, even before you came to see me that you were having a baby? I wasn't sure. Tell me, of all the doctors you could have gone to, why did you pick me? There wasn't anyone else I could. Well, when you talked to us this morning, I felt suddenly that you could help me somehow. How? You seem to care so much more about people than just any doctor would, and so... So you came to me for help, and all I did was talk to you some more. There is nothing I wanted from you, Dr. Pretorius, that would have affected your conscience in any way. Not even the tiniest hope that, uh, perhaps for your father's peace of mind? I wouldn't want to buy my father's peace of mind at the cost of yours.
Did Miss Higgins make another appointment? Miss Higgins? Sorry, I meant Mrs. Higgins, of course. No, Doctor. She left without saying a word. Sometimes, Shunderson, it seems to me that half the women who come in here want babies they can't have, and that the other half... She's old enough to know what she's doing, and to take what's coming to her. I never want to hear you say anything as idiotic and heartless as that again. But, Doctor, For one I thing, you're a nurse, and for another, you're a woman. I'm ashamed of both of you. Now, keep in mind, this is 1951. A pregnant woman had two options. You keep and raise the child, or you give it up for adoption. And interestingly enough, in some states in the United States, now, in 2023, as I'm recording this, women still only have those two options. After leaving Noah's office, a gunshot is heard. Noah, the nurse, and Shunderson race outside and find Deborah laying on the ground after shooting herself. She is still alive, and she is rushed to surgery. Instead of trying to shoot herself in the head like most suicide attempts, Deborah aimed for her chest, completely missing her heart and other vital organs. After a successful surgery, we actually hear Shunderson speak. Is it bad? Mm -hmm. It's a good thing most people have the foggiest notion where the heart is actually located. She didn't even come close. Why'd she try to kill herself? Uh, I imagine, Shunderson, that when people need help the most, it must sometimes seem as if they're all alone in the world. Isn't that true? Then she'll try it again. She's still all alone. And if there's still nobody to help her, she'll try it again. Sometimes the people that speak little speak loudest in terms of meaning. In addition to his medical practice and teaching duties, Noah is also the conductor of an orchestra comprised of fellow doctors, professors, and students. Noah has a lot of fun ribbing Dr. Lionel Barker, played by Walter Slezak, who takes it good naturally as intended. Noah, there's something I want to talk to you about. Here and now? Well, it's fresh on my mind. Just for a minute. Sit down. You behave as if you were about to propose. Noah. One of the differences between matter and mankind is that in matter all relationships can be stated, whereas between people they can rarely be put into words. Granted. Now I want you to know that I'm your good and devoted friend. I've been aware of that for some time, and I am yours. Therefore I have the right to point out to you that there are occasions when you behave like a cephalic idiot. Also granted, any particular occasion. Out of a universe full of time and space, only you could pick Rodney Elwell's anatomy class. Ah, uh, the good word gets around, doesn't it? Don't take this lightly, Noah. There's been trouble brewing. Talk of rummaging about in your past. Let them rummage. They're spitting into the wind. And all this talk about charges and whatnot, of an investigation. Noah, as a friend, tell me. Can Elwell dig up anything in your past that would conceivably discredit you enough to justify say a hearing before a faculty committee how much discredit is enough i've known you intimately for 10 years and i can't even guess at what you were up to the day before i met you suppose i told you all could it affect our friendship of course not i'm glad to hear that you know it's not much to have a friend who knows all about you but one who's a friend even though he's not quite sure that's worth having and will you tell me just this about the bat. The bat? I thought you knew that's what they called him. Shunderson. Who calls him that? Why, the, the students, the faculty, even the staff at your own clinic. No, I didn't know. It's not a proper name for him. Noah, who is he? A man named Shunderson. Where does he come from? Why is he with you day and night, everywhere you go? I have no right to tell even you anything about Mr. Shunderson. Can Elwell uncover something about his past, or yours, or both, that he can use to make trouble? That depends. Drop me by the clinic first, will you? I want to look in on a patient. That patient is, of course, Deborah. Don't turn the light on, please. You've been crying again. That doesn't necessarily follow. Well, that's a pretty good guess when a woman wants the light kept off. Either that or her face is none. I don't mind being seen without makeup. 
I don't mind seeing you without makeup. You know all about women, don't you? Not nearly enough. I don't mean just as a doctor. Not even as a doctor. Deborah, I, uh, I've got something to tell you. And as a pompous know-it-all... I didn't mean that even when I said it. As a pompous know-it-all, it isn't going to be easy. But do you remember the remote possibility that I thought could never occur about the frog being wrong? Well, the frog wasn't wrong, but you've got the wrong frog. It seems the possibility of a laboratory assistant making a mistake is not remote at all. I don't understand. Two tests were being run at the same time. One had a positive result and the other negative. Through unforgivable negligence, your report read positive when it should have read negative. Then I'm not having a baby after all. You're not having a baby after all. Sleep well. You've got nothing to worry about. That's what you think. Now what are you crying about? It's just awful. What is? To think I had to go and tell you all about myself and what I did. Now it turns out I didn't really have to. Well, did you go to have someone to tell it to? But not to you. Why not? I'll see you in the morning, Deborah. Dr. Pretorius. Mm? Are all your patients women? Almost. I guess they all fall in love with you. Not all of them. Just most. Not even most. Good night. And while it goes without saying that suicide should never be an option for solving one's problems, it really hit home for Deborah after getting the news about her false positive pregnancy. As it turns out, the story that Noah told was not true. Deborah is indeed pregnant. He told Deborah this lie for a few reasons. He wanted her to get a good night's sleep after her surgery and prevent her from trying to kill herself again. The other reason was he wanted to buy time in order to try to find the father of the baby. However, Noah gets a phone call from his clinic while dining at home with Dr. Barker that Deborah has snuck out of the hospital and cannot be found. Noah and Shunderson decide to drive up to the country where he believes Deborah is staying, as her father Arthur, played by Sidney Blackmer, is staying there. His brother and Deborah's uncle owns the farm and large home. Noah meets with Arthur, who passes along the story that Deborah told him about her accident, which was that she burned herself badly with a curling iron. Arthur is pleased to meet the much-talked-about Dr. Pretorius. Though Deborah is shocked and, frankly, unhappy to see Noah, believing that he will divulge the real cause of her wound. While Deborah helps make dinner, Arthur confides in Noah about his life. After failing in different businesses, his health failed, making him completely dependent on his stingy brother after his wife died. He feels the only good he's ever done is having Deborah, but feels guilty that she must help him. This is likely what she alluded to when she confided in Noah at the beginning of the film about why she couldn't tell her father about the pregnancy, nor, of course, of her failed suicide. Noah then meets the stuck-in-the-mud John Higgins, and you can see why Arthur and Deborah are less than thrilled to be in his debt. Sunday ain't Sunday without chicken. Two things I guess I did every Sunday in my life, go to church and eat chicken. Don't you ever eat chicken on a weekday? Only on Sundays. But if you like chicken so much, why don't you eat it more often? Because I only eat it on Sundays. Uncle John lives according to a very strict schedule. Two things I live by, the good book and the calendar. I got a day's work to do every day in the year. I take care of my work and the good book takes care of me. Then you do the same thing every day of every year, is that it? Just like the cows and horses and vegetables. That's right. That's what the good Lord and old Mother Nature put us here for. To do the job they set out for us. Oh... Well, I can't speak for the good Lord, of course, but I know a little about old Mother Nature. If old Mother Nature had her way, there wouldn't be a human being alive. How do you mean that? I mean, among other things, that old Mother Nature tries to destroy us periodically by means of pestilence, disease, and disaster. 
That's why the human race has been at war with old Mother Nature ever since it became the human race. What do you mean, became the human race? Is that what you teach? No, and I'm not really a teacher. That merely happens to be my opinion. Mm. You make a lot of money? John, really, I don't think you... I don't mind telling him. Yes, Mr. Higgins, I make a lot of money as a doctor. But then I'm one of the few fortunate ones. <laughs> I'll see. We got one here in town, works night and day. Hasn't got a red cent. If you had a teacher here in town, he'd be a little worse off than even your doctor. But then the government doesn't pay them for the patients they don't treat or the children they don't teach. Oh, you mean like uh, I get paid for not growing some crops? I never could figure that one out. But then uh, never ask too many questions about it. Never look a gift horse in the mouth. You? I never look any horse in the mouth. Hmm. Well, I'm going back to working on my books. Then I'm going to sleep a while till it's time for my radio programs. Off and schedule today, income tax. I ain't complaining, though. Got more deductions than I thought. Doc, do you mind if I put you and your friend down as a couple of feed salesmen? Flattered. Just don't call me Doc. That way I deduct the whole dinner. Every little bit helps. I write it all down in a book. Most of my equipment don't cost me a thing, writing it off year by year. What's it called, Arthur? Depletion and depreciation. Yeah, that's it. Means it's running down. Don't work so good as it did. One thing about teachers and writers and such. They have less bother with their income tax than farmers and oil well owners. That's so? Why? Because their equipment is talent and a highly developed mind. And when they run down and don't work so good as they did, the depletion and depreciation can't be written off their income tax. See what I mean? What's so smart about them? Don't play the radio loud while I'm sleeping, Arthur. No, John. Noah, being a rational and educated person, tries to make his points as well as he can to the stubborn Uncle John. But frankly, that's life. Not everyone is pleasant to be around. While Noah and Deborah walk around the farm before dinner, Arthur confides in Shunderson. Mr. Shunderson, Dr. Pretorius has come here to ask Deborah to marry him, hasn't he? I wouldn't be surprised. Well, that's interesting. While some may have believed Noah's visit was about her pregnancy, we now have something else to consider. All right, there's about 40 minutes left and plenty of unanswered questions. Is a marriage proposal truly what Noah had planned when he arrived at the farm? If so, would Deborah even accept? Also, how will Noah fare in the undeserving investigation from Dr. Elwell? In addition, we discover more about Shunderson and his amazing story and why he's so important as a friend to Noah. This is really a terrific and deliberate film that is just as relevant today than ever, and, and many people have not seen it. For me, as a huge fan of Cary Grant, this is yet another film where he shines in a role that he was meant to play. Jean Craig is gorgeous and plays her role equally well. But Finlay Curry, who plays Shunderson, he's really an underrated character, and he's vital to the film. You may have seen many Cary Grant films, but this one you might have missed, so I really recommend you check it out. All right, some fun facts. In early pre-production, Gene Crane campaigned for the female lead, but the role went to Ann Baxter. After Baxter had to forfeit due to being pregnant, Crane's wishes were granted. If you didn't know already, Baxter had starred in All About Eve a year prior. Cary Grant had left his hand in footprints outside of Grauman's Chinese Theater in Los Angeles as part of the opening publicity for this film. The pictures of him taking part in the ceremony of making his prints in the cement clearly show the People Will Talk poster on the theater's famous next attraction wall, which is kind of cool. All right, for those that don't want to wait to find out what happens in this film, I do have a radio adaptation from Lux Radio Theater from January 25th, 1954, which reunites Cary Grant and Gene Crane in this radio adaptation, so enjoy that. But again, check out the film, it's terrific. And I'll be back next week with yet another random movie from my DVD collection. Starring Cary Grant and Gene Crane in People Will Talk. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. If you saw 20th Century Fox's fine drama, People Will Talk, 
I'm sure you continued to talk about it long after you left the theater. About its unusual dramatic ingredients. The mysterious and romantic Dr. Pretorius. And the frightened and desperate girl who turned to him for help and understanding. And of course you recall the outstanding performances of the stars who portrayed these two central figures. So we, we have invited Cary Grant and Jean Crane to recreate their exceptional roles in People Will Talk. Now, Act One of People Will Talk, starring Cary Grant as Dr. Noah Pretorius and Jean Crane as Deborah. <laughs> Several years ago, a young and wealthy doctor came to the university. He came for two purposes, to teach medicine and to open his own hospital clinic near the campus. In both endeavors, Dr. Pretorius has attained remarkable success, but he remains very much a man of mystery. Well, it's early evening. At his clinic, Dr. Pretorius has just completed the rounds of his patients, and now in his office... I'll have the other reports from the lab in the morning, Doctor. Um, what about Mrs. Adams? Run another test. How was she when you made this one? Depressed? Cried all through it. Well, when you want it again, call me. We'll make a laugh through the next one. See what happens with a different set of emotional factors. Well, if you like. Uh, may I see you now, Dr. Pistorius? Well, nurse? It's Mrs. Fawcett. She's nearly ready to go home, but she wants to take her gallbladder with her in a bottle of alcohol. Oh, I think that's quite touching. That's a habit. But you know we don't keep gallbladders lying about once they've been removed. Mrs. Pegwistle, it's highly unlikely that Mrs. Fawcett would recognize her own, so why don't you just give her any old gallbladder? Make a habit. Oh, very well, if those are your orders. Oh, uh, what about the girl in 204? Deborah Higgins? Oh, I've just been in to see her. I've left full instructions with the charge, nurse. I'll see her again first thing in the morning. Thank you, doctor. Now, may I see you, doctor? Come in, Miss Fillmore. Rebellion in the diet kitchen, I presume? Doctor, unless all the patients are served breakfast at the same time, I simply cannot run the kitchen without present personnel. Then hire more help. But it is common practice in hospitals. Miss Fillmore. In my clinic, no patient shall be awakened from a health-giving sleep and forced to eat breakfast at a time which happens to please a culinary union. But in the interest of good economy... Bad therapy is never good economy. Now, if you must economize, do it in the doctor's dining room. Oh, and while I think of it, Mrs. Pegwistle... Yes, sir? I would not have all the patients bathed at the stroke of a gong for the convenience of the nurses. Now, one of the reasons for my founding this clinic is a firm conviction that patients are sick people, not inmates. Of course, Dr. Pretorius. All right. If anything comes up, you can reach me at the University Orchestra rehearsal till 10.30. I'll be home at 11. Good night, all. Thank you. You can get the car, Mr. Shunderson. Orchestra rehearsal? Ah, someday I'll discover something he can't do. He conducts the orchestra. Wouldn't miss it for the world. Just don't ask me where he finds the time. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Tonight, for the first time, your attack was not pre-medical. The horns did not sound as if they'd been sterilized, and our violins at long last indicate a realization that catgut can create notes as well as sutures. Now, if it were not for the gentleman in back of the bull fiddle... Well... Dr. Barger, now, is there any reason why you, who live so intimately with millions of neutrons and know them all by name, cannot maintain a simple beat on a bull fiddle. My only mistake is that I follow your beat religiously. <laughs> I do not mean to impugn your academic standing, of my course. My dear uh... Dr. Pretorius, mm -hmm. I would willingly entrust my life to your skill as a surgeon, but I would not permit you to conduct my three-year-old nephew to the bathroom. <laughs> the fact remains that I am the conductor and you pay no attention to me. Oh, I pay absolute attention. That's the trouble. Unfortunately, Dr. Barker, you are the only one in our group who possesses a bull fiddle. Now, let us hope that by next rehearsal, the two of you will have become better acquainted. Well, that's all, gentlemen. Thank you very much. <laughs> Shall I get the car? Drive it home, Mr. Shunderson. I'll ride with Dr. Barker. Oh, and uh, don't wait up. You'll make me very unhappy unless you go straight to bed. Good night, Doctor. Mr. Shunderson is not ill. No, just old. I keep forgetting he can't stand these long hours anymore. Noah, something I want to talk to you about. Here and now? Yes, while it's fresh on my mind. Just for a minute. 
Now, sit down. Now, you behave as if you were about to propose. <laughs> now, first, I want you to know that I, uh, I am your good and devoted friend. Now, I've been aware of that for some time. And I am yours. Then believe me, please, when I tell you there is trouble brewing. Professor Elwell and certain other members of the faculty, they've started to rummage about in your past. Noah, it's serious. Let them rummage. They're spitting into the wind. Noah, can Elwell dig up anything that conceivably would discredit you enough to justify a hearing before a faculty committee? Mm. How much discredit is enough? I have known you intimately for ten years, but I can't even guess at what you were up to the day before I met you. I suppose I told you all. Could it affect our friendship? No, of course not. Well, then? Well, tell me just this, then. Shanderson, who is he, Noah? Why is he with you day and night, everywhere you go? I've got no right to tell even you anything about Mr. Shanderson. Well, can Elwell uncover something about his past, or yours, or both, that he can use to make trouble? That depends. Well, shall we go? You can be very exasperating, you know. Drop me by the clinic first, will you? I want to look in on a patient. At this hour? No, I know. You don't happen to have a student by the name of Deborah Higgins, do you? Higgins? No. No Higginses. Well, she stopped by this afternoon for a checkup, and as she was leaving, she paused in the corridor, took out a small revolver, and uh, shot herself. She tried to kill herself? Yeah. That's a good thing. Most people have the foggiest notion where the heart is actually located. She'll be all right. Just a superficial wound. Why did she try to kill herself? You no, know, I imagine that when people need help the most, it must sometimes seem as if they were all alone in the world. Isn't that true? That's no answer. However, if she is still all alone, you know, if there is still no one to help her, she'll try again. Won't she? As I said before, drop me by the clinic, will you? Who is it? Dr. Pretoria. Steve, don't turn on the light. You've been crying again. Is that it, Deborah? Have I? That's a pretty good guess when a woman wants the light kept off. Either that or her face is none. You, You know all about women, don't you? Not nearly enough. I don't mean just as a doctor. Not even as a doctor. Deborah, I, uh, I got something to tell you. And as a pompous know-it-all... I didn't mean I... to call you that this afternoon, really. Even when I said it. As a pompous know-it-all, it isn't going to be easy. Now, when you came to see me and I told you that you were going to have a baby, I also mentioned the remote possibility that the laboratory diagnosis could be wrong. Those fog tests, remember? Well? Well, the diagnosis wasn't wrong. The fog reacted perfectly. You merely got the wrong report. I... I what? You see, two tests were being run at the same time. Through unforgivable negligence, you were given the Mrs. Bixby's report. And you mean I'm... I'm not having a baby after all. You're not having a baby after all. You've got nothing to worry about. Oh, that is what you say. Well, now, what are you crying about? Oh, it's just awful. What is? To think I had to go and tell you all about myself, and, and now it turns out I didn't really have to. Well, as a matter of fact, you told me very little. Something about a young man who used to be a student here. You were going to be married when he came back, but he was killed in Korea. Oh, it's all such a crazy nightmare. Well, it's good to have someone to tell it to. But not to you. Well, why not? Oh, never mind. Oh, but at least now my father won't have to know. From what you said about your father, I can't understand why you'd be afraid of him. Afraid of him? Oh, no. He's, he's the most gentle and understanding man in all the world. But you see, I'm all he's got. And if this had, had happened, it would have killed him. So rather than that, you prefer to kill yourself. Oh, and now you tell me it was all just a mistake in the laboratory. Well, I, um, I'll see you in the morning. Dr. Pretorius. Yes? Are all your patients women? Almost. I guess they all fall in love with you. Not all of them. Just most. Not even most. Uh, good night, Deborah. Sleep well. What a mess. Oh, what a mess. Well, help yourself, Lionel. Knock first, sauerkraut, and beer. Mmm, smells delicious. Mm. <laughs> 
Believe me, if it were not for your Knockwurst after rehearsals, I would resign from your orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell me, your patient at the clinic, maybe now you'll tell me why she shot herself. Uh, because of an unpremeditated baby. Oh. I stopped by to tell her she was not pregnant after all. Oh, lost the baby, huh? What was it, shock or when she fell? She's as pregnant now as she ever was. Well, then why in the name of good sense tell her that she isn't? You know, having a baby, my dear boy, that's not the state of mind, Pazzo Pickles. <laughs> I have two reasons. One, to get her a good night's sleep. And the second, to keep her from trying suicide again until I can fa find her father and talk with him. What has her father got to do with it? Uh, she's got an unshakable conviction that the knowledge of what she has done will kill him. And you intend to talk him into clicking his heels with joy? <laughs> Well, I intend to convince him either to be compassionate about it or to convince her that her father will survive and her chief responsibility is to the baby. Noah. Yes? Has it ever occurred to you that most of this is none of your business? What is my business, Lionel? Oh, to diagnose physical ailments and to alleviate them? No. My business is to make sick people well. Now, there's a vast difference between curing an ailment and making a sick person well. Hmm. Wonderful sauerkraut. That tastes like sauerkraut used to taste. I'll tell Mr. Shutterson. He'll be pleased. Hello. <clears throat> when? Oh, I see. No, no, no. Don't do that. Don't notify the police or anyone else. I'll take care of it in the morning. Keep looking, of course. Let me know if you find her. Good night. Who flew the coop? That young lady? Yes. Why? I don't know. But I've got to find her. Yes, I should think so. It seems you've got some important information about her that she hasn't got. <laughs> but, Noah, be careful. Whatever you do, remember Professor Elwell is going to find out about it, and if he possibly can, he will use it against you. Where would she go, Lionel? Where? Well, to her gentle and understanding father, of course. Yeah, yeah. You're right. <laughs> decided to take a Sunday morning drive out in the country, Mr. Shunderson and I. And oddly enough, Mr. Higgins, we found ourselves... I can't my... tell you how delighted I am, Doctor. I've heard so much about you from my daughter. Have you, Mr. Higgins? Well, won't you, Mr. Shunderson, come up on the porch and sit down? Thank you. How fortunate you and Deborah were such good friends when she had that ridiculous little accident. I, I still don't understand how a girl can accidentally burn a deep welt on her side with a curling iron. Hmm? <laughs> well, it's not uncommon for women, female students in particular, to curl their hair, eat, read, and telephone all at the same time. The results often are disastrous. Yes, I imagine it could have been worse. Much worse. Mm. I happen to be devoted to porch sitting here, uh, but if you'd rather go inside... No, this is very pleasant. And I see that you're properly protected against too much fresh air. You uh, don't believe in the benefits of fresh air? I do not. Nor do I believe that eating fish develops a brain. Oh, I could go on for days. <laughs> you must tell that to Deborah. She's forever driving me out of the house. Father, Uncle John says that if we're going to have dinner on time, we... Oh! Uh, we have guests, Deborah. Yes, I, I see. Hello, Doctor. Hello, Mr. Shunderson. Good morning, Miss. <clears throat> I was wondering about that nasty little burn you got from the curling iron. Oh. Oh, it's, uh, fine. Well, it's been almost a week. And since we happen to be driving out this way... Well, surely you and Mr. Shunderson will join us for dinner. No, no, really. We couldn't impose upon him. Dr. Pretorius must have more important matters. Nonsense. We can't let them drive miles to get here and then send them away on fame. We'll be happy to stay. Have you, uh, been here long? Your father and I have just been getting acquainted. Dr. Pretorius has a way of knowing people very well, very quickly. And after all, you've told me so much about him. Uh, father, I, I'm not at all sure that it's good for you to be out of doors. There is nothing healthier than fresh air. Uh, don't you have something to do in the kitchen? I haven't the slightest intention of leaving this porch. Uh -huh. It also seems that Deborah's told me a great deal about you, Mr. Higgins. <laughs> there wasn't much to know, was there? The number of accomplishments in my life is one, Deborah. 
quite an accomplishment. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd rather not be discussed this intimately on the front porch. On the front porch, you're in the test tube. It's obvious that you are going to be discussed. So, uh, why do you insist on remaining where you're not wanted? Well, why should you want to discuss me? There, there's nothing to discuss, is there? Deborah, it's quite apparent that Dr. Pretorius has come to talk with me. Now go and tell Bella that there'll be two extra for dinner. Well, what about Uncle John? Mm, he's doing his books. Uh, I'll tell him later. I would like to help. Oh, no. No, please, Mr. Shunderson. It isn't necessary. Oh, let him. It's a good idea. He'd be of great help. Uh, may I ask, is uh, Mr. Shunderson your servant? No, he's my friend. But he likes to help. Oh, I see. I, um, I referred to Deborah a moment ago as the only accomplishment of my life. I'm sure you were being modest. Well, she's more than my only accomplishment. If you'll permit a rather lurid analogy, Deborah is my heartbeat. Mr. Higgins, now, please don't feel that you have to tell me anything. No, no, no. I, I want to tell you about myself for just a moment. Now, my brother John owns this farm. He owns the food I invited you to share, the beds we sleep in, and the clothes we wear. Also, Deborah's tuition, and the tobacco in my pipe. The pipe is mine. I have other possessions, some scrapbooks, a thin volume of poetry. Mine, too. It was published, but it didn't sell, of course. And Deborah, the memory of my wife. I wondered about her. She died when Deborah was very little. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'll find Brother John. Now, perhaps it would be better if we didn't oh, No, say. please, please, I'd consider it a favor. I won't be long. Now, Mr. Shunderson, I thought you were helping in the kitchen. The woman didn't want me. It, it's not going to be easy what you came here for. I came here to... Oh. Come on, let's go for a walk. Well, now, that was a very fine meal, Mr. John. And they ain't sent me without chicken. Well, don't you ever eat chicken on weekdays? Only on Sunday. Hmm. Well, if you like chicken so much, why not eat it more often? Because I only eat it on Sundays. Uncle John lives according to a very strict schedule. Oh, Two yes. things I live by. The good book and the calendar. I get a day's work to do every day in the year. I take care of my work and the good book takes care of me. Then uh, you do the same thing every day of the year, is that it? Just like the cows and horses and vegetables. That's right. Mm. That's what the good Lord and old Mother Nature put us here for. Mm. To do the job they set up for us. Well, I can't speak for the good Lord, of course, but I know a little about old Mother Nature. Mm. If old Mother Nature had her way, there wouldn't be a human being alive. How do you mean that, Doc? I mean, among other things, that old Mother Nature tries to destroy us periodically by pestilence, disease, and disaster. That's why the human race has been at war with old Mother Nature ever since it became the human race. What do you mean, became the human race? Is that what you teach? Oh, that merely happens to be my opinion. Hmm. Well, I'm going back on working on my books, income tax. Ain't complaining, though. Got more deductions than I thought. Doc, do you mind if I put you and your friend down as a couple of feed salesmen? <laughs> oh, no. Mr. Shunderson and I are flattered. Just don't call me Doc. That way I deduct the whole dinner. Just don't play the radio too loud while I'm working out there. No, John. Uh, Deborah, uh, why don't you show Dr. Pretorius the farmer? I'm sure he'd be interested. All right. I'll get a sweater and meet you outside. Tell me, Mr. Higgins, how old were you when you learned to walk? Mm, I did pretty well by the time I was four. When did you leave the farm? When I was 16. Hmm. It couldn't have taken you 12 years to make up your mind. I'll wait for Deborah out on the porch. Do you enjoy music, Mr. Shunderson? More than anything. Good. I'll turn on the radio. Mr. Shunderson, Dr. Pretorius has come here to ask Deborah to marry him, hasn't he? I wouldn't be surprised, Mr. Higgins. And in this barn, well, this is the dairy. The cows are out in the pasture. Doing the job good old Mother Nature gave them, huh? <laughs> Uncle John has eight cows. Of course, that's far more milk, butter, and cheese than we need, so he sells the rest in town. 
That makes it a commercial enterprise, and he can write off the dairy and the equipment and the cows. <laughs> Oh, my, all that book work. No, I think I like the dairy best of all. Hmm. Now, down there's the room for the separator and things. Oh, I'd stay out of there if I were you. You might get caught in a room with a dead end. Now, why did you run away from the clinic? This, of course, is, is the separator where the cream gets separated from the milk. Why did you run away? It works by centrifugal action. The cream being lighter than the milk rises to the surface. Deborah. Because I had to. Why? I had to, that's all. Why? Because. Why? I had reasons. What? They were private and personal. You know, I don't have to tell you everything. Why? I'm in love with you. What makes you think so? I can't give you symptoms. It's love, not measles. Am I being pompous again? Well, there are some things you can't be scientific about. Even so. Now, why should that make you want to run away in the middle of the night in your bathrobe and slippers? I didn't want to see you the next morning. I wanted to see you. Not if I knew about you. What you knew about me, you wouldn't want to. Possibly. I don't know. A person just doesn't fall in love that fast. Or that often. I just couldn't lie there anymore and think about it. Oh, don't you see? If I do love you, then then how could I have been in love with him? And if I didn't love him, then, then why? Oh, and anyway, even if I did... Why did I have to go and tell you about it? Turn around. Are you crying again? No. I just want to run away again. No, no more running away. You know, you were right about your father. I couldn't have told him. He'd have understood, but I couldn't have told him. Certainly you couldn't have. Now, you tell me something. Why did you come out here? Hmm? Well, what do you mean? It couldn't have been to talk to my father. Well, as a matter of fact... Because if it were, what about? There wasn't anything to tell him, really, was there? Well, no, not really. A superficial the... flesh wound like mine. You certainly weren't worried about that, were you? Of course not. Going to all the trouble of finding me, searching the registrar's records and whatnot? Why did you come all the way out here? Oh, I don't know, really. I think you do know. What's your first name? I can't go on calling you Dr. Pretoria. Uh, Noah. Oh, Noah's a cute name. Yes, well, my real name is Ludwig. <clears throat> You see, uh, cream is the oily part of the milk. It's not actually a separate uh-huh. product. I prefer no. Now, in homogenizing milk, for instance, the particles of fat become emulsified. I do not want to appear unladylike about this, but I can't think. Cream becomes part of the general body of the milk. With you That's, of all men. You uh, couldn't have come out here because you wanted to talk to my father. Oh, dear. And you couldn't have come out because you were worried about my health. And there comes a time when a patient asks the doctor questions. Come on. Why did you come all this way just to see me, Noah? I did have a reason, you know. I know. Oh, no, you don't. But it doesn't seem to matter much at this moment. You're being pompous again at the moment. Oh, you'd be surprised how unpompous Then what I... are you doing? Come here. Well, things do have a way of happening, don't they? Oh, Mother Nature... Oh, Mother Nature knows best. In a moment, Act Two of People Will Talk. Now, our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act Two of People Will Talk, starring Cary Grant as Dr. Noah Pretorius and Jean Crane as Deborah. It's an hour later. Deborah, her father, and Dr. Pretorius are upstairs in the farmhouse. I still say this is just plain silly, dropping my suitcases out the window. You know, there's no reason why we can't just walk out the front door. Oh, go on. It's much more fun this way. When are you going to break the news to Uncle John? As soon as you've gone. Uncle John's going to be awfully angry. I hope so. Now, Dad, remember your promise to come and live with us. Of course he will. Much against everybody's better judgment, including my own, I intend to live very happily with you. Golly, I'm scared. Well, there's nothing John can do to any of us. Well, she's not scared of John. She's scared of me. Pompous know-it-all. Mm-hmm. It just so happens that what I'm afraid of is that you don't really want to marry me and that I won't make you a good enough wife. Well? Well. In the first place, I'm not in the habit of marrying women I don't really want to marry. You know, Father, his first name isn't really Noah. And in the second place... It's Ludwig. The woman has yet to be born who doesn't in her heart believe she'll make her husband a much better wife than he has any possible right to expect. (laughs) I just 
don't want to get married tonight. I don't want a long engagement, but can't I even have one day? You'll be married in New York. That takes three days. Hmm? I must think. You're the only man I ever heard of who acts, well, well, exactly like some poor girl who's got to get married. Hmm. I imagine that as a man, I've come as close to it as any other man who ever lived. <laughs> now, uh, uh, let's get out of here. Hello? Hello, Professor Elwell? Yes, yes. This is Conan, Professor, from the detective agency. I got news about Dr. Pretoria. Well? Just stay in your office, Professor. I'll be right over. Well, first of all, Professor Elwell, he just got married. Dr. Pretoria and a girl named Higgins. They got married in New York this morning. I don't require a detective agency to tell me that. Posted that news on the faculty bulletin board. Oh. Well, here's something that ain't on the bulletin board. You see this newspaper? Take a look at this picture. Now, whose picture would you say this is, Professor? Shunderson. You bet it is. Right on the front page. Shunderson. But, but this newspaper. What? Why, it's dated March 12th, 1921. That's right, Professor. Only there's no doubt about whose picture it is. Is there now? No, I, I'm positive. This is Shunderson. But why is his picture in this newspaper? Start reading, Professor. It makes some very interesting reading matter. Very interesting indeed. Well, Mr. Shunderson, I thought the rehearsal went very well tonight, didn't you? Yes, sir. Very well. Mm. I wish Deborah and her father had come along. Give them a chance to get settled in the house, sir. You didn't forget to invite Dr. Parker to dinner tomorrow night? <laughs> he invited himself. Lionel never forgets my birthday. It will be a wonderful birthday for you, with a fine wife at the table. Uh, it's been quite a week, Mr. Shunderson, quite a week. Doctor, before we get home, there's something you should know. Someone's been following me today, a hmm? detective. Hmm. How do you know? I have a gift for such things. Perhaps it would be better if I went away now. You've made a great career. You have your home, your wife, responsibilities. No. What should I do, Doctor? Exactly what I shall do. Wait and see what happens. There's someone at the front door. Professor Elwell from the university. At this time of day, Professor Elwell? I told him you'd be sitting down to dinner soon, but he said it's very urgent that he see the doctor, ma'am. Shall I call him? What are they doing upstairs? The three of them, ma'am. Your father, Dr. Barker, Dr. Pretorius, they're, they're playing with what you got him for his birthday. The electric trains, ma'am. <laughs> Good. Then I'm not going to disturb him. I'll talk to Professor Elwell. I'm sorry that you insist, Mrs. Pretorius. Oh, believe me, I have no wish to upset you. But I want to know, Professor Elwell. I want to know why you're here. Very well, then. Dean Brockwell has asked me to give Dr. Pretorius this envelope. It contains a list of charges that have uh, been brought against him. Charges? By whom? What charges? I am not privileged to reveal them. But you know what they are. Unhappily, I do. Well, I uh, must be going. I admire your courage, Mrs. Pretorius. Most women would be, uh, shall we say, uh, apprehensive. Most women are not married to my husband. That's true. Hmm? Whatever he did, he did for good and sufficient reason. Even if it turns out that he, that he murdered somebody. Your devotion moves me, Mrs. Pretorius. Mr. Shunderson? Yes, ma'am? Will you show the professor to the door, please? He's leaving. You see this envelope, Shunderson? Yes, sir. Give it to the miracle man. Let me have it, Mr. Shunderson. I'll take it up. And he, he was very disappointed, Noah, that he couldn't hand you this in person, mm. this envelope. Oh, anyway, he's gone now. Oh, well, uh, envelope. Have you read this? No. Then why are you crying? That's just it. I don't know why I'm crying. 
And whatever it says, I don't believe it anyway. Well, nevertheless, according to this document, I am not the picture of innocence you imagine me to be. Do you want me to tell you about it? Not if, not if you think you shouldn't. Not if you think you shouldn't. Now, you know, that's a phrase used exclusively by women who assume a man's guilty without having the guts to come out and say so. <laughs> Nothing could be less important to me than this whole business of rumors and charges against you. That's my girl. No, I you... You haven't done anything you shouldn't have, have you? Many times. But not as a doctor. Now, don't let it worry you. I won't. Noah? Hmm? Does it seem to you that I cry a lot? Well, you know, truthfully, darling, there's never been anything like it since the little Dutch boy took his finger out of the dike. <laughs> he never took it out. That's why he was so brave. Pompers know it all. I never used to cry at all, you know. But now the least little thing and I start shedding buckets. Why do you suppose it is? Why do you suppose it is? Well, I, I get to upset easily these days. And I used to be, well, if anything, sort of calm, even placid about things. What did you say the name of that frog was? Frog? What frog? The one you told me about when I first went to the clinic. The, the one who gets pregnant in two hours. Oh. The frog does no such thing, darling. It merely shows certain helpful indications. Well, I'm beginning to show certain indications. Anyway, I think I am. <laughs> I feel so silly talking to you about it. I know just what you mean. It's the sort of thing you'd rather discuss with a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> what seems to be your trouble, Mrs. Pretorius? Well, right now I feel a little like Elsie Dinsmore. I, I'm all confused. Heaven knows, knows, after all I've been through these past few weeks, I have a right to be, but, but not this confused. No, darling, forgive me for being little Nell from the country, but... But is it possible? Little Nell, Elsie Dinsmore, or Catherine the Great, it is entirely possible. Well, if it's possible, then you should be the first to know. It is also probable. Do you mind? Uh -huh. Comes the dawn, I'll stand on that window sill and crow. Come the dawn next December, you'll be walking the floor with it. Uh, next September. December, dear. September. Now you're getting mixed up. December. September. My dear Dr. Pretorius, unless they change the rules about how long it takes, I, I make it December. Oh, the rules still hold. You're just not starting back far enough. Oh, don't be silly. How can I possibly start any farther back than... No. Oh, no. You're quite a noble character, aren't you? Oh, I never thought of myself as one particular... Oh, no, really. I mean, I've heard of doctors who were self-sacrificing and unselfish. But apparently, there's no limit to yours. Deborah, you couldn't be more wrong. Well, you're that afraid I'd kill myself. Now, how afraid is that afraid? Afraid enough to marry me, to keep me from it? Is it conceivable to you that I would? Then why did you marry me? Because I'm in love with you. You fell in love all of a sudden, didn't you? All of a sudden, I was still falling. Let me know when you hit bottom. Any time within the next 30 or 40 years. You came out to the farm that day because you knew I was going to have a baby. Then you met my father and my uncle and you understood why I tried to kill myself. Did I? Only by that time, you were all mixed up in it because you told me that silly lie about the wrong frog. And I was so obviously in love with you. It was all over me like a tattoo. And so, with no possible way out for anybody, all of a sudden, you fell in love with me. And that solved everything, and everybody lived happily ever after. For two weeks, that is. For two weeks and three days. Until I found out that my baby isn't going to be yours. Funny. This calls for tears, and I haven't got any. No... What makes you think this isn't going to be my baby? Because it isn't. Because it... Yes, yes, I, I know. And however true, it has nothing to do with our baby. Now, his interest in this world will begin, as it does with all babies, when suddenly, through no fault of his own, he's rudely deprived of a warm, secure, and well-fed existence, which he has every reason to believe will go on forever, and finds himself upside down in the air, being smacked on the backside. <laughs> now... Are you going to love him? Of course I am. Oh, so am I. And we'll keep him warm. And we'll feed him. And make him feel secure again. And uh, give him brothers to play with. Oh, boy. 
are. Well, it's time you stopped thinking about yourself and start, started thinking about my baby. Noah, if you really suddenly fell in love with me... No, if... Why? I couldn't say why. Haven't you ever wondered? Falling as fast as I am, I don't have time. A man as exact as you with a reason for everything? Then I'll find it. Any time in the next 30 or 40 years, I'll start wondering. I won't be doing much else, it looks like. Except wondering about you and me, about you and the baby, me and my fine character. Are you feeling sorry for yourself? I'm feeling sorry for you. Don't be. I love you. Be there. Forgive me. Shut up. Love me. Do the guests ever eat around here? Oh, good heavens, Steve. It's your birthday dinner. Right away, Lionel. Many happy returns, No, I thank you. As for this, Professor Elwell's greeting, may I? You may indeed. What will they do? Call a meeting. You'll ignore it. On the contrary, darling. There's very little I can do, but get it over with. What can they do to you? Considerable. Will they? Mm, I wish I knew. on Act 3 of People Will Talk, starring Cary Grant as Dr. Noah Pretorius and Jean Crane as Deborah. Tonight, two events are scheduled on the campus of the School of Medicine. In the crowded auditorium, a restless audience and a group of bewildered musicians await the arrival of their conductor, Dr. Pretorius. But Dr. Pretorius suddenly has been summoned to a closed hearing in the office of the dean. <coughs> My intention, Dr. Pretorius, to conduct this hearing informally. Wouldn't you care to join us up at this end of the table? Thank you, Dean. I would prefer to remain as remote as possible. I suggested it merely to avoid having our discussion take on the appearance of a trial. Oh, I appreciate your thoughtfulness, but I have no intention of regarding an investigation of my methods as a cozy little chat among devoted friends. Here, here, Dr. Barker. No one speaks without being recognized by the chair. I am by nature a man who interrupts. However, I shall try. Thank you. Dr. Pretorius, may I suggest that you give us a brief account of your activities prior to your arrival at this university? I prefer to be questioned. Why? Because I do not intend to tell things about myself of my own volition, which are nobody's business but my own. They are the concern of the entire medical profession. I, I have been recognized, Professor. Your objection is understandable, Dr. Pretorius. Professor Elwell, you may begin. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Pretorius, will you agree to abide by the verdict of this committee? I'll do nothing of the kind. Why not? Because I don't know what the verdict will be. The verdict will affect you seriously whether you agree to abide by it or not. Then why I ask idiotic questions to which you already know the answer? <laughs> yeah, one horse on you, Elwell. <laughs> Will you admit that in 1939 you were a highly successful quack and miracle healer practicing in a remote little village in the southern part of the state? I will admit nothing of the kind. Very well. Where did you live in 1939? In Goose Creek. Would you describe Goose Creek as a thriving metropolis? It is a remote little village in the southern part of this state. Exactly. And what was your source of income in Goose Creek? My practice. You practiced openly? I was available to anyone at any time. I mean to say, did you set up a practice as doctor of medicine? When I came to Goose Creek, I had my degree. I did not, however, display it on my door. On your shop door? His shop door? Isn't it true, Dr. Pretorius, that in that remote village you opened a butcher shop? That was an honorable trade, if ever there was one. In itself unimpeachable. But what did you sell in your butcher shop? Beef. Chops and poultry at cost, fish on Fridays. At cost? Then how did you make your living? 
I made sick people well. Aha. Now, why should that startle you, Professor? I still do. Your practice flourished in Goose Creek because of the pathetic willingness of those poor people to rely upon a belief in miraculous cure. Because of the readiness with which so many people will prefer the glamorous quack to the licensed physician. Professor Elwell, despite your definition of a quack, as someone who does not practice medicine according to your rules, the fact remains that a quack is an unqualified person who pretends to be a doctor. I was a licensed practitioner, and therefore not a quack. As for the willingness of those so-called backward people to rely upon the curative powers of faith, I consider faith properly injected into a patient as effective in maintaining life as adrenaline. And the belief in miracles has been the difference between the living and dying as often as any scalpel. Now, that is not the issue under discussion. It is precisely the issue. Whether the practice of medicine should become more and more intimately involved with the human beings it treats, or whether it is to go on in its present way of becoming more and more a thing of pills, serums, and knives, until eventually we should produce, no doubt, an electronic doctor. The issue at hand, quite simply, is that you amass a fortune by treating sick people who believe that you are a miracle-working butcher. I could not have amassed that fortune unless I had made an enormous number of sick people well. Oh, all this folder all. It has nothing to do with the ethics and honor of our profession, but it has everything to do with the envy of one man's genius for healing the sick. Corporatorius, a psychiatrist, high priest, voodoo, medicine man, witch doctor, anything you like. But don't investigate him, gentlemen. Learn from him. Professor Bach, it was understood that you would not interrupt. I'm sorry you can strike my remarks from the record. <laughs> I'm sure you all agree with me anyway, so why don't we call off these monkey shines and start the concert? It would interest me, Dr. Pretoria, to know why you ever left this lucrative practice in Goose Creek and under what circumstances. I'd always intended to leave when I'd acquired enough money to start a clinic of my own. As it turned out, I departed a little sooner than planned. I had a housekeeper, an inquisitive maiden lady who discovered my medical diploma in a bottom drawer of my desk. In a matter of hours, the entire village knew that I was not a butcher at all, but a licensed M.D. I was confronted by a crowd of angry townspeople and forced to admit the truth. I narrowly escaped being run out of town on a rail. Any more questions, Professor Elvo? Uh, a great many more, thank you. Uh, Dr. Pretorius, who is Shunderson? I take it you mean Mr. Shunderson. Mr. Shunderson is a friend of mine. Is he associated with you professionally? No. He helps in whatever he can, where and when he pleases. Well, he's never very far from your side for long, it seems. Rarely. And what was Mr. Shunderson before you knew him? Well, you refuse to answer? I certainly refuse. You have always evidenced a remarkable tolerance for this strange and mysterious man. His blundering and slow witness, of course, constant complaint, and yet you persist in protecting him at all times. Now, why? Perhaps because I know the reason for his so-called slow wittedness. And is the reason of so delicate a nature that you can't disclose it? I have no right to disclose it. Then I shall. Gentlemen, Mr. Shunderson is a convicted murderer. Who is it? Shunderson, sir. Oh. What are you doing here? I was listening through the door. I protest against this highly irregular and probably prearranged eavesdrop. Oh, Elwell, you can use more words more unpleasantly than any other pipsqueak I have ever known. <laughs> I want to tell my story, sir. Dr. Pretorius will never tell it. Well, let us hear it by all means. Okay, doctor. It's up to you. I'm not a fancy talker. I, uh... I don't know a lot of words. Now, that alone is a welcome relief. Well, now, I... Uh, don't start with well, now. Uh, where should I begin? Tell them when you were condemned to death for murder. The first time? Of course. Well, the first time was in 1921 in Canada. It was Christmas. It, it wasn't a very merry Christmas. I had a sweetheart, a friend... friend. We were very close, the, the three of us. Well, this one time we were mountain climbing. 
my friend and I, we we didn't get very far before we started to argue. I I don't remember what about. We always argued, as friends do. But this time he hit me with a rock. So I hit him with one. Uh, not too much detail. Uh, anyway, we, we had a bloody fight, and he ran away, so I went back to my sweetheart. She took one look at the blood on my clothes and saw that I was alone and started to scream, Murderer! Murderer! That was how I found out that my sweetheart and my friend were sweethearts. Mm. Who saw to it that you were arrested and charged with murder? Oh, my sweetheart, of course. I was found guilty of murdering my friend, and I was condemned to death. But because nobody could produce the corpse of my friend, my sentence was commuted to 15 years of hard labor. And was the corpse of your friend never found, Mr. Chanderson? Oh, I found it myself, Dr. Barker. After I served my 15 years, I went to Toronto. I happened to look into a window of a restaurant and... There was the corpse of my friend sitting at a table eating a bowl of soup. I I think it was pea soup. <laughs> Immaterial and irrelevant. Well, I I went in and spoke to my friend in a very friendly fashion. I asked him very nicely where he had been for 15 years and why he never admitted that I had not killed him. His answer, gentlemen, was unsatisfactory. So I, I hit him in the face with his bowl of soup. <laughs> then I hit him with the chair. Then somebody called a policeman and I took the club away from the policeman and I used it to finish up on my friend. <laughs> when they arrested me, I tried to explain that if I was committing a crime, it was a crime for which I had already paid the penalty. They arrested me anyway. You were uh, released, of course. Oh, no. I was sentenced to death again. Well, how could you be tried twice for the murder of the same man? Oh, the, the prosecutor was very fair about it. He was willing to admit that my first conviction was probably a miscarriage of justice. But he said I didn't have the right to commit a murder just to correct that mistake. And I was condemned to be hanged. But this time you were pardoned. Oh, no. You see, the fact that I had killed my friend with the policeman's club made it a very serious crime. Then uh, will you tell us, please, how you managed to escape? I, I didn't escape. I was executed. Why, this is absurd. It was on the morning of February 29th, 1936. Uh, a leap year. It was a gray and rainy morning. The hangman's assistant held an umbrella over my head so I wouldn't get wet. <laughs> the minister said a prayer and I closed my eyes and thought of my mother. Then the floor went out from under me and that was that. Oh, I must protest against this childish assault upon our intelligence. You be quiet. Then, then what happened? The next thing I felt was a finger. It was in my mouth pressing down on my tongue. I, I bit it and somebody yelled. I, I opened my eyes and that was the first time I saw Dr. Pretorius. I, uh, I think I can make the next part of the story clear to you. At the time all this happened, I was just finishing my studies as a medical student. I was also keeping company, as they say, with a young lady who happened to be the hangman's daughter. Uh, both the hangman and his daughter were generous and sympathetic. The hangman in particular was sympathetic to my desire as a student of anatomy to have a cadaver I could call my own. Well, knowing that Mr. Shunderson's body would go unclaimed, because certainly no one was ever more alone in this world than poor Mr. Shunderson was, the hangman managed to send it to me immediately after the ceremony, along with a sweet note from his daughter. I was delighted, of course, but not for long. I soon found out that Mr. Shunderson was still alive. Oh, you must have been furious. <laughs> he told me his story, and we put some pig iron in the cheap wooden coffin that he'd arrived in, and we had it buried in a charity graveyard. From that day on, Mr. Shunderson has never left me. 
And I think it's understandable that from time to time, he may seem a little confused and perhaps even a little dull-witted. But to say that he... Deborah, you're interrupting us here. Uh, Mrs. Pretorius, it's customary to at least knock I before... know, and I don't mean to include too much, gentlemen. But I'm sure that by now you must have made up your mind. A wife simply does not come barging into a room where her husband is being investigated. After all, gentlemen, if he's innocent, he's late for the concert. And if he isn't... Well, he'd better start conducting anyway, because he may have to earn his living at it. I am of the opinion that the hearing is at an end. Do you agree, Professor Elwell? My opinion no longer seems to matter, does it? The trouble with you, Elwell, is that you never had a cadaver of your own. <laughs> Much less one that bit your finger. <laughs> and as for this incredible evening, gentlemen... The sooner we forget it, the better for all concerned. I think we've held up the concert far too long. Come along, Mr. Shunderson. Yes, sir. I haven't said so many words in years. All in a bunch. You did very well. I'm proud of you. Professor Elwell, that little man, that poor little man. Father? Yes, dear. He's a terrible conductor, isn't he? Yes, dear. Freddie seems so happy up there. I honestly believe he's the happiest man I've ever known. He's crowing on a windowsill. What's that mean? Old Mother Nature. Old Mother Nature knows. <laughs> In a moment, our stars will return. Please step forward for your curtain call. Cary Grant and Jean Craig. Well, uh, what's the next week, Eddie? Well, next week, we have another charming star who has just returned from abroad. Jean Tierney. Mm -hmm. Miss Tierney will co-star with one of the most handsome actors in Hollywood, Victor Mature. And we will present them in one of 20th Century Fox's all-time screen hits, the unforgettable... Laura. That's one of my favorites. Good night. Good night. Good night. And hurry back. <laughs> Hollywood Radio Theater is produced by Mr. Irving Cummings. Our orchestra directed by Rudy Schrager. This is Ken Carpenter inviting you to be with us again next week for another worldwide presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. Brought to you through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. If you are ever in the San Francisco Bay Area and still love collecting or renting DVDs or VHS tapes, come check out Captain Video and San Mateo at 2837 South El Camino Real. Captain Video is open six days a week and closed on Wednesday and one of the last traditional video stores still running in the United States. New movies you can rent for $2.99 a day. Old movies you can rent for $2.99 for five days. And if renting isn't your thing, you can also purchase anything you find in the store. Be sure to tell Ira that you heard about Captain Video from the Damn Good Movie Memories podcast. Happy renting and happy collecting at Captain, at Video. Captain Video. 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 Come hang out and chill with Brian A. Davis and the Bad Beat. Wednesdays, 11 p.m. Eastern, right here on ThatMetalStation.com.